But, uh, but why don't I invite our, our two panelists up here, Vicky and Ted, um, who are going to give us, uh, they, they brought their crystal balls with them, and they're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, state policy, state budgets, and uh, what's on tap for, for the state as it relates to early learning. And then more importantly, what we can do here locally as a Big Lift Collaborative and the PPLC and individually to help out their efforts. So why don't I just uh, have them introduce themselves and we can jump into a couple questions. Hello. This is a good. Is this evening now? Good evening. <laughs> I'm Vicki Ramos Harris with Early Edge California. Ted Lemfert with Children Now. All right. So um, speaking of that crystal ball, uh, Ted and, uh, and, and Vicki uh, with their respective organizations have um, done a lot of work um, with the state and uh, get, making sure that we've had a number of wins and reinvestments in early learning and childcare and preschool and reimbursement rates and all the like uh, over the last couple of years now um, to the tune of almost $600 million, I believe. So uh, that's, that's the good news, uh, but we have a long way to go. Last I checked, I think from 2008 uh, till right now, we're still about $1.1 billion short of where we were in 2008 in terms of spending for early learning, uh, childcare, and preschool programs. So maybe Ted and Vicki, you can tell us what we're doing to sort of keep the momentum going in terms of the budget and any other legislative pieces that are coming up next year. Sure, and I know we'll kind of tag team here. Um, so, we've had a couple of good years. We had a couple of really bad years before that, but, but we have had a couple of years of important momentum. Um, we've had leadership on both the Assembly and the Senate prioritize early care and education in a way that we have never seen, um, which has led to important increases uh, in our budget. Um, the Women's Caucus has been incredibly strong in their leadership, and we know that the uh, Legislative Black Caucus has also made early learning an important priority. Um, and today we have or our up new speaker, Speaker Rendon. He has a background in early childhood education, so we know he gets it. Um, and so these are all the things that have helped us get to today. Um, we know that... While AB 47 was vetoed, we got something very important in that veto, and that is in the governor's own words, and I wrote it here to make sure I read it. In his own words, he recognized the state's intent to make preschool and other full year f and full day early education and care opportunities available to all low income children. And Vicki, can you tell us what AB 47 was really quick? Thank you. AB 47 was a piece of legislation, uh, Preschool for All Act, um, that was the goal was to take the state's budget language from a couple of years ago and make it uh, l uh, provide a timeline so we could get to all low income fours in just a couple of years. So the governor said he doesn't really want to be on that quick timeline, but he did recognize that we need to get the state's the state's intent to do that. So that was a, that's that was a big win, particularly for a governor who's not our biggest champion on early learning. Um, so in terms of last year, we heard a lot about access, affordability, and quality. Um, and we know that this year, we're going to continue to build on that. Um, but we also know that um, our legislators have heard that last year and this year. And so the restoration is important, but also reframing so that they understand what we're going to do beyond, how we're going to get move the needle and how, how we're going to embed quality, looking at our conversation that we just started having right now, the importance of quality in this, conversation, in this conversation. So rates we know are incredibly important for retaining our uh, teachers, for recruiting our best teachers, for resourcing our programs. Um, but as an example of tr sort of turning the conversation a little bit to just investing in the things that we lost and kind of thinking more about building the system that we want to have for our, our families, right? Um, so the rates conversation is, yes, we need more rates, but how can we look down the line at perhaps maybe having a one system of rates and merging our, 
uh, our two, two different rates, our SRR and our RMR. Um, how can we do that so that we are really reflecting the regional, uh, regional rates and the different complexities that we have? How do we simplify all that and make sure it makes sense? Now, that's a longer conversation, but what are maybe step one for that uh, rates reform that we want to talk about, in addition to talking about the, w the reason why we need increases in rates? Um, I f I'm dominated here. Do you want to add? <laughs> yeah, Ted, any, anything on budget or, or legislation coming up you foresee? Yeah, for, I'm just, uh, Vicki and I work a block and a half away from each other in Oakland, so thank you for the late afternoon meeting <laughs> closer to San Carlos. Um, so I just wanted to add to uh, uh, Vicki's point, and just a, a quick context point, like why, why should you even care about the state when you're doing all this great work here? And, and I would just say two points. Uh, my colleagues at Children Now, we're all around the state talking about the big lift as we do local engagement throughout the state. Uh, we are ahead of the game in San Mateo County, but we need efforts like this throughout, uh, throughout the state. Even if you guys achieve all your goals, we're not going to get every kid reading at grade level in third grade because so much needs to be done. So the reason you need to care is this is all hands on deck, local, state, federal. So you need to continue to set the model local. And what we're working on, and if we haven't made it easy enough for you, come talk to me. We're making it so easy that you can spend three seconds and have a huge impact at the state uh, uh, level. So you keep doing what you're doing here locally, and then the state matters as well, um, and, and the feds. Because, and I loved, Ava, how you talked about high income families. I'll tell you where to find quality. Um, I, I, it's right here in our community. Uh, with, with families where they're sending their three and four year olds to preschool and where, quite frankly where they're sending their kids to K through 12. You, you see that quality. It's very, very expensive and there are also accountability measures. But if, it, but if we're talking 30, 40 grand per kid at, at those higher income levels and you multiply that and then you say, well wait, uh, English language learner, a kid in intense poverty, kid facing stress needs even more support. You're talking a huge amount of dollars. So we have a long ways to go convincing the public of that, uh, but it's why we need local, state, federal. So just to add on to uh, uh, Vicky's great report, just a good news and then a, a couple other issues. I mean, what, 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 as Vicky went through that, what we need to recognize is that the legislature has actually prioritized this issue um, and that it, both the last two years, what the legislature did, the governor got most of what he wanted in the budget. Um, this is a pretty powerful governor. The legislature only was able to successfully push back on a couple of issues, and, and this was one, the, the, the birth of five in these wins. So what we need to tell our local legislators and all the legislators, and I was just meeting with a legislator yesterday, is thank you, thank you, but keep going. It has to be the first priority next year and the year after and the year after because we're so behind on the investments in this area compared to gov other government services. The two other quick points is I really appreciate the tenor of this conversation about the complexity of it. You know, when my kids went to preschool, I didn't say, good, I'm done. Being parent is really complicated. So from the policy level, you know, we need to focus on the areas that the big lift is focusing on and also home visiting and also developmental screenings and, and also community ways. So there's a, a lot going on, but the good news is our, our legislators are actually getting up to speed on this, especially the, uh, the local delegation. And so yeah, I, you keep the focus on these four areas here, but then we'll be sending you all things about the different target points where the state needs to figure out a way to make sure home visiting is included in Medi-Cal, to make sure that 100% of children get developmental screenings when they're infant and toddlers, not the current 28%. So there's a lot going on at the policy level, um, but the good news is our, our legislators are getting it. The last thing, uh, we live in a weird state where de direct democracy plays a big role. So what happens in the initiative the, uh, process and what we all vote on next November will probably have the biggest impact on the budget. And very quickly, there's three initiatives out there um, in, in, in priority order for birth to five, the best one is the Lifting Children Out of Poverty Initiative, which I urge you to take a look at. The dollars go mostly to key birth to five uh, programs. A gentleman named Conway Collis is sponsoring that. The next best is the SEIU proposal, which at least siphons off 10% for uh, early learning. The worst is the California Teachers Association proposal, which keeps the funding, the post Prop 30, at, at, the, at the same expenditure rate. So birth to five gets no extra bump. It, we, it, it keeps prisons at the same level, everything at the same level. So I gave them the order of the best in terms of policy. In terms of politics, flip it. <laughs> the CTA one is the one the most likely to move forward, then the ISIU, then the Conway College. How can you help? 
if there's multiple measures on the ballot next year that say we need more money, they might all lose. If folks come together on one measure, it has a better chance. And so I think it's important to talk to your local, and I'm very serious about this, your local CTA chapter, your local SEIU chapter, say, how come the lifting children out of poverty language isn't in your organization's initiative? Because in the next month, They've got to come together and adjust the initiative. So all politics is local in, in CTA and SAU and the California Hospital Association. So Sutter and you know folks you know and who, who are involved in the hospital industry, as sort of frustrating as this sounds, those three entities are going to have a huge say in what goes on the ballot. And they need to make sure early learning is a priority. And, and that could literally shift uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars depending on what gets on the ballot. The lifting out of children, lifting children out of poverty. What is the what is the me funding mechanism for that? Ted? Uh, yeah, so the the CTMA um, one is higher income, as is the SEIU. The the lifting children out of poverty is is a very interesting. It's it's a it's a uh, progressive property tax. So any uh, property over three million uh, gets a gradual um, uh, surcharge. So it's an interesting take on on uh, a Prop 13 reform. So it's an example of how we need to uh, uh, get the funding, the prioritization for early learning in so many different ways. And, and one other way, um, Vicki, if you want to talk a little bit about transitional kindergarten, given all the school districts uh, in the room here and some of the expanded TK mm -hmm. uh, work that you're doing uh, for the next two minutes, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so transitional kindergarten, we know, got it started getting implemented a few years ago. In this past budget, there was language included that clarified that school districts could enroll children when they turned five. Now, that was true before. What it clarified was that if a school district wanted to enroll the child when they turned five, they could do that. Or if they wanted to enroll them at the beginning of the year, they could do that as well. Clarifying that, um, they can enroll them at the beginning of the year, but the school district will not receive um, a, ADA, average daily attendance funds, until they turn five. So if a district said, well, we want to put some of our general fund in to, you know, f to pay for the first few months, and then we know that the funding will kick in for that student once they turn five, we're willing to do that. So this is a longstanding practice, and the clarification of the language came because there, was, there were questions. There were some interpretations that said, no, you have to wait until they're five, and others that says, no, you can start at the beginning of the year. And so you had school districts across the state who had chose to do a mid-year program or chose to enroll kids at the beginning of the year. So now it's clear that the districts still have that choice. Um, so we, in terms of what it looks like and the impact, it means that districts can, if they choose, want to enroll more children into transitional kindergarten if um, they're willing to put some funding on the table to do that. Um, some districts are choosing to do that or exploring it because for some, they're interested in um, getting to standalone TK classrooms and adding five more kids or 10 more kids into their classroom um, will allow them to do that. Other districts feel like it's not quite a right fit for them or they need a little bit more time to plan and that's their choice. So this is, um, TK is a mandate that districts have to offer. In terms of expanding TK, that is the district's choice of whether or not they can do that. So districts are using local control funding formula or their general funds, um, things like that. Um, in terms of what it looks like across the state, it's hard to say right now how many kids they're serving because it also depends on the birthday cutoffs. Each district can decide if they want a birthday cutoff of January 1st or you know um, March 30th, or some districts are um, uh, allowing kids who have a birthday at the end of the school year um, so it really depends on the district's choice of when they want to, um, inc what birthday cutoff they'd want to have and how many students that they're willing to fund. Um, so we see some districts who have um, included kids who start at the very beginning of the year and are not giving them a full year of TK, um, and other, kid, other districts who are doing a half-year program. So we are taking a look at the landscape across the state to, to try to figure out to what extent are districts interested, how many students can we figure out so far are being impacted, and then if for districts who choose to do that, how can we help, and for districts who choose not to do that, let's learn more about why they're not interested. Um, the goal is to maximize uh, opportunities for families. So 
we know that 40% of our threes and fours don't have any access to TK, Head Start, or state preschool. So there are a lot of kids who still need support. And if expanding TK but from a district's perspective is an option for them, that's fantastic. And er Early Edge has a lot of this information and, and how it's worked in LA and other school districts across the state um, on their website. So if you want to go check it out or, or grab Vicki later on to talk about how it works and, and some best practices so far with expanded TK, she'll, I'm sure she'll be happy to to check in with you. But let's, we have time for two questions for, for Ted and, and Vicki. Yeah, let's go here and then there. First two hands that went up, sorry guys. <laughs> yeah, it's quick today. So, um, so I do have a question regarding uh, the governor and the funding. Um, you know, this governor has said many times that he only, you know, with the surpluses we have, he only wants to spend on one-time projects, one-time things, not create new programs. So what recommendations would you have for one-time things that could help uh, with our third grade reading challenge? It, what two questions to that first we need to push back on, on on that and you know back to the Vanderbilt study let's do a study of the impact of correction spending and us ranking second in the country uh, police and fire other government services where we rank very high and then education and in preschool and return on investment um, and and so we need the governor to not view all programs as equal which he's essentially been doing under other than high-speed rail and saying we're gonna invest in that no but seriously he's been saying let's invest in that but then treating every other program as equal and cutting or increasing and saying different programs have different return on, on, on investment and, and importance and education has to be one. But to, your, but to take him where he's at, um, there's a, 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 a number. I mean, there's facilities needs in, in early learning. There's some teacher training and, and, and support that can go into a, a, a one-time funding. Uh, I don't think this governor would agree with a data system upgrade, but that you know is another uh, key. So we've actually, and I can share with you some lists of some one-time funding uh, requests for the, for the uh, governor that we can put in, but it's also important to recognize that you know we need to uh, ongoing consistent support for these programs as well. Jean mm -hmm. Marie, I think you had a question. So my, my question has a little bit to do with the quality piece. Um, and last year, the, um, the legislature put into place the Quality Rating Improvement System Block Grant for state preschool program and followed it on with a second version. And I believe there's something coming for infants and toddlers, which is um, really an important uh, vote for quality. Also, I understand the Department of Finance thought this was a great idea, yes. and all of our big risk classrooms are part of this. Do you have any sense of um, continuing in, in uh, interest and commitment on the part of the legislature or the governor's office to continue to pursue that? Well, we have in terms of the QRS for preschool in particular, the $50 million we get is annual. So there's a very important commitment there. Um, in terms of infant toddler, the QRS, that was one-time funding. And we're hoping that was the foot in the door to have a bigger conversation on QRS because we know quality is so important. We know that um, quality is something that resonates with folks at the Department of Finance and the governor, so that's good. Um, so that's, I mean, that's an important part of the conversation and the, our goal is to get that to be continued. Um, we also recognize that um, our race to the top funds are sunsetting and we really need this robust, we need to continue that investment in quality. So, um, Part of that work is to make sure we're telling the stories about the importance of quality, what we're doing with those funding. One of the most important things I think we can share is with these investments in quality, especially in our QRIS, but anything, any of the investments that we got from the state, we need to be telling the stories about why they benefit children and why we need more and what, how efficiently we're using the funds that we have today. Because it's really hard to go back and ask for more funding if we're not using the funds that we have right now well. So collecting stories from you all on what that means here and, and how that needs to be maintained is gonna be really important in terms of the advocacy work that we're doing together. Yeah, I would just add to that real uh, quick. It's, it's so important that uh, as you do the quality me measures here, say can 
we ap apply this statewide because the, the push at the state level is similar to you know education and other programs is to have a, a sensible accountability metric and maybe even you know attach funding to that so higher quality uh, more funding so you guys can really lead uh, the way in that I, I would just also say I've actually been relatively in, impressed with the focus on quality given two things given the natural political in inclination is as access and, and slots right more slots more slots and that's how a legislators wired to think so the fact that there's been as much focus on quality has been positive I think though that's essential because you know I wish there was this focus on quality and other government programs but we, we need to keep remembering and this gets to the public communication side we are so under invested in this area I, I mean massively very different than really any area of, of government that we engage in, whether it's law enforcement, corrections, even health, social services, we're massively underfunded in the birth fight because we didn't, it, the world's different and we didn't know all this 30, 40 years ago and we were set up differently. So quality becomes even more important because it, how are we gonna convince folks not only that this stuff is important, but to now prioritize it and literally invest billions. The only way we can ever win that argument is to say and we have a quality rating system so if something's not high quality you, you, you know we're going to know and not fund it so I, I just can't impress enough that the work you're doing here locally to really help guide what that state system could look like is, is really critical well thank you both now as we get into the next year's legislative session i heard talk to your legislators tell stories look into expanded tk and look into these three measures that that ted mentioned uh, as well. Let's give Ted and Vicki a great round of applause. <laughs>